and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Wendy Koch. I'm a member of the Board of Governors of the National Press Club and foreign affairs writer for Hearst Newspapers. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, as well as, as those of you watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Be before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of upcoming speakers. On Tuesday, June 18th, Michael Jordan, chairman of Westinghouse CBS Group, will talk about the restructuring of Westing Westinghouse and how the network fits into the plans. On Thursday, June 20th, Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin will talk about the upcoming G7 conference. And on Friday, June 21st, primate researcher Jane Goodall will address a press club audience. Transcripts and audio and videotapes of press club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-NPC-2334. If you have any questions for our speaker, please write them on the cards provided at your table and pass them up to me. I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. And you can hold your applause until I introduce all of them. From your right, Phil Sheenan, New York Times. Chris Plant, military affairs producer, CNN. Paula Gallagher, Stars and Stripes. John Fales, also known as Sergeant Shaft, columnist, Washington Times. Mary Otto, Knight Ritter Newspapers. Major General David McLeod, Director, Force Structure, Resources, and Assessment. Stan Kroc, Business Week. Brigadier General Ro Ronald Sconyers, Director of Public Affairs. Ed Schaefer, St. Louis Informer, a member of the Press Club Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon. Paul Mann, Executive News Editor, Aviation Week and Space Technology. Ann Crawford, Publisher, Military Living. And finally, Tom Breen, Editor, Air Force Times. <laughs> Sheila Whitnall is a woman of many firsts, a breaker of barriers. She was the first graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where she received a bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degree, appointed to the engineering faculty. She was the first woman to serve as chair of the entire MIT faculty, where she worked for 28 years as professor and later as associate provost. And now, as we know, she's the first woman to head a department of the armed forces. As Secretary of the Air Force, she heads an organization of 800,000 people with a budget of about $75 billion at a critical time. The Air Force is now flying as many as 200 missions a day in combat zones around the world. Dr. Whitnall is one of the world's leading aerodynamicists with more than 70 publications to her credit. She knows exactly what's involved in the operation of a jet fighter. Her research has aimed at making flying safer, having solved problems such as turbulence. She also flies them, Air Force fighters, tankers, and transports. This fascination with flying came early. As a child during World War II, she would dash outside to wave at planes soaring over her Tacoma, Washington home on their way to McCord Air Force Base. Though she never served in the military prior to her current post, she was no stranger to the Air Force. She served on several of its boards and committees. I always wanted to be Secretary of the Air Force, she's quoted as having said. From her late father, Roland Evans, a cowboy turned college math professor, she learned how to build things. She owns several patents, including one for a fin that makes windsurfing boards more stable. She's an avid windsurfer, sailor, and bicyclist. And from her mother, Genevieve, a juvenile pr probation officer, she learned how to juggle, juggle career and family. Dr. Whitnall is married with two grown children. She's won many awards over the years and was recently named by the Times of London as one of the world's 100 most powerful women. I understand one of her favorite awards, though, is the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Young Man of the Year Award. <laughs> 
Dr. Widnall is with us today to talk about the United States Air Force in the 21st century, shaping defense for a new world. Welcome. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I'm honored to be here at one of the most distinguished forums in the nation. Wait a minute. This is the National Press Club? I thought this was the National Chess Club. <laughs> oh well, I guess you folks might be interested in what I was going to say to a bunch of chess geeks. Although I'm now a little worried about the intellectual level of my remarks. Actually, I'm pretty impressed as I look out over the audience. I've never seen more than 50 journalists wearing coats and pants that match. So I guess you're up to it. Today I describe to you an Air Force that represents the best that America has to offer. An Air Force involved in dramatic successes and less herald but extremely important humanitarian and peacekeeping missions. An Air Force that is fully engaged in the present and thinking hard about the future. I'd like to use a chess analogy to help explain our situation. Without getting overly involved in the comparisons, we can draw some parallels. Each move has a current objective as well as a role in future operations. Each piece has visible as well as invisible capabilities. The players range from kings to pawns, and the playing field is a checkerboard of possibilities with checkmates occurring from just about anywhere. Let's look first at the situation which comprises today's international security environment. No longer are there simply two kings on the board. In fact, the variety of threats we must deal with and plan for and counter now shape an Air Force that is far different from the one which waged the Cold War. We're smaller. We've stepped up to new missions. We're adapting revolutionary technologies, and we're supporting all of these changes by streamlining our business practices and improving efficiencies in every aspect of our operations. Let's look at some of our more visible strengths. The air and space capabilities we offer the national command authorities are in higher demand than ever before. Our long-range bombers, can launch from the U.S. and reach any point on the globe with precise, lethal strikes in 20 hours. Our versatile fighters provide the secure air umbrella in which to conduct operations that Americans have grown to expect. And our mo air mobility fleet enables us to respond to a full range of contingencies, from airlifting troops and equipment during a crisis to delivering supplies after a national disaster. I'd like to take a few minutes to recount some recent successes and some ongoing international operations that rely on our current abilities and illustrate the importance of our nation's leadership around the globe. As everyone here is aware, the Air Force changed the course of history in a traditional military way last September when we led a precise vigorous air campaign that finally altered the series of events in Bosnia. Besides breaking the cycle of violence that had fed that three-year war, Operation Deliberate Force also gave us a hint of what combat will be like in the 21st century. For instance, while only 9% of all munitions used in Desert Storm were precision guided, in Bosnia, 98% of the munitions dropped by U.S. forces were precision guided. Our chess analogy is useful to explain what this means for the changing nature of warfare. Today, precision weapons have made it possible to take any piece on any square of the chessboard with no collateral damage to adjacent squares. If you look at the bomb damage photographs from Bosnia, they bear no re resemblance to photos of the past, where the target, often undamaged, was surrounded by craters. The photos from Bosnia typically show one crater where the target used to be with virtually no collateral damage. 
Nothing is yet assured in Bosnia, of course, but by joining the use of force to diplomacy, we have transformed a situation some considered hopeless into one in which rebuilding, reconciliation, and justice are possible. One could argue that in a historic sense, America has no vital interest in the Balkans. But in a world connected by an instantaneous electronic nervous system, where the images of anger, hatred, and death on one side of the world immediately inflame similar passions half a world away, vital interest must be interpreted differently. It is in all the nation's interest that such destructive passions be dampened. And it's obvious that no border can shield us from these and other dangers. Serious threats such as terrorism, proliferation, crime, and damage to the environment abound. And yet the end of the Cold War has get also given us an unprecedented opportunity to shape a more secure world in which American interests and ideals can thrive. Our strength is a blessing, not a burden, and we must use it wisely, not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of people around the world who seek to build a better life. Over the past months, I've had the privilege of traveling around the world to visit our forces operating in Asia, in Europe, and in the Middle East. There are very few common elements across those areas, but one very clear thread running through the tapestry of the globe is the role that America plays in bringing stability to these widespread regions and the role that the Air Force plays in that historic effort. Last summer, for example, I visited Central Europe to see for myself the movements in those nations with the end of the Cold War. We visited Prague, Budapest, Bucharest, and Warsaw. And while each nation has its unique problems and opportunities, everywhere we found people wrestling with the fundamental questions that we here have faced for so long on the role of a military in a democratic society, on the proper role of a parliament in regulating a national military, and in allocating resources between domestic and security requirements, on the role of the media in shaping public opinion that is so fundamental to shaping an effective military force. Everywhere, we found the same yearning, yearning for integration with the West not just to join NATO and get a security guarantee, but to join the West economically and politically and to rejoin the, the West culturally. Although in their hearts, it was clear that they thought they had never left. On the way, we spoke with the Czech Minister of Defense who mentioned that his deepest regret as he led the drawdown and restructuring of the Czech military was that he had not paid enough attention to informing the public and the people in the military about what was going on. He had never been in a system that demanded public awareness of such issues. We spoke with a base commander in Pardubis in the Czech Republic who briefed us on the new sets of issues that he now spends his time on day to day. Environmental issues, noise complaints, meeting with the local politicians and the media. I should note that although he was very happy with the ongoing formation of his country, there were some parts of this transformation that he could have done happily without. I sat in a garden eating lunch with the commander of the Romanian Air Force, General Sandilescu, and heard him describe the years under Soviet domination and the sacrifices of the Romanian people and their feeling that they are a part of the West, that they must be a part of the West. I met with members of our military liaison teams. In many cases, these are Air Force reservists who have been called up and sent to these partnership nations. In many countries, these military liaison teams work directly out of the host Ministry of Defense, and they see the senior staff daily. And I met with Polish officials who desperately want to buy our equipment, not just because it works, and they know it does, but because it brings with it a large measure of integration with the West, and more important, with America. Like everyone through the region, they spent long, dark decades wondering when the Americans would come. Well, now we're there in ever-increasing numbers. 
And in fact, those same Polish officials were also willing to drive a hard bargain on co-production of that equipment. So they've come a long way. In all these transformations, the Air Force has played a major role, not merely in exercising with these nations, in working with them on operations, but also in instruction on such basic elements as constructing a military legal system and a promotion system based on merit. During that trip, I talked with our defense advisor to our mission at NATO headquarters, Catherine Kelleher. She commented on how the Air Force's long tradition of focusing on getting the right people in, of motivating them and training them, and ensuring that they have the opportunity to contribute to the utmost of their capabilities holds a very powerful attraction for these states as they go about such fundamental tasks as creating a professional NCO core. They look to us as a model. In the Middle East, American leadership has been indispensable. Several weeks ago, I returned from a trip to Turkey and Israel, where I spoke with senior officials, visited Provide Comfort and Incirlik Air Base, and viewed Israeli operations from the perspective of our close relationship. Over the past few years, in large part because of the steadfast involvement on the part of America, we have moved towards a comprehensive peace between Israel and its immediate neighbors, and indeed with the entire Arab world. The peace remains a realistic prospect, although it certainly will take much effort, much patience, and much wisdom before we reach the success that is now visible. We're continuing our efforts to resolve conflicts and build security in other regions. We will strengthen the foundations of peace and security in the Asia-Pacific region by deepening our security cooperation with our treaty allies and through the, our participation in the ASEAN Regional Forum. Our bases there provide a powerful message that we are committed to our Asian partners. And our daily activity and training exercises with our allies underscore our nation's commitment to peace and to involvement in that region. Besides our obvious historic strengths, we're also working on a wide variety of invisible, behind-the-scenes capabilities that allow us to ensure information dominance. As we speak, our space systems high overhead are providing this nation unmatched and indispensable global awareness and connectivity. Imagine how you could control the game if you could see all the pieces on the board, but your opponent could only see his major players plus a few of your pawns. A number of new systems are helping us see all the pieces. Joint stars in the unmanned aerial vehicles like the Predator, for example. From outside, Joint Stars looks like an ordinary Boeing 707, one you might expect in some commercial air cargo fleets. But inside, the aircraft is packed with a powerful ground surveillance, targeting, and battle management system. And we've used those capabilities to great advantage in the Balkans. A month ago, I took a trip to Bosnia and Italy because I wanted to see all of this for myself. At Vincenza, I visited the command center where General Mike Ryan directed the very complex multinational air operation that took place there. I saw the systems that we use to display real-time the air picture, both friendly and enemy. I saw the intelligence cell in a room adjoining his command center. I saw information dominance in action. I watched our commander seeing the action on a real-time overhead projection of the aerial battlefield and retasking our forces to get the mission done, adjusting our intel assets to get the right picture as the action unfolded. I saw us gather data and distribute in minutes throughout the NATO chain of command, a process that only a few years ago would have taken weeks and not minutes. All of that technology in the end was there the battle commander, the picture he needs to make the right decision and the connectivity he needs to get the decision carried out in accordance with his vision. In years past, we have spent billions making sure our lethal technology would work. We've built the best aircraft on Earth, witnessed the F-15 with its unmatched avionics and aerodynamics and its weaponry. This latest generation in control, however, helps the battle commander 
to get the right number of F-15s to the right place at the right time. We're making the investment in the human dimension to create the same sort of superiority that we have long enjoyed in our equipment. Nor is this investment focused solely on our commanders. During my visit to Aviano, I talked with some of the pilots who had participated in deliberate force last summer. They demonstrated the power scene system that had formed such an important part of their capabilities during that remarkable air campaign. These pilots, when assigned a mission tasking, had the capability to sit in a room at the back of the wing headquarters in Aviano and to practice flying the mission on a simulator that visually displayed the Bosnian terrain that they would be operating over to a resolution of one meter. These pilots could practice their mission, get comfortable with the visual landmarks and threats in the target area, try different tactics and approaches, and in doing so, eliminate some of the nasty surprises that are a fundamental feature of combat. They marveled at the realism of that simulator and how they got so involved in the mission, although they were planted firmly on terra firma, that they finished the training period tired and with sweaty palms. They all came away from this experience with a keen understanding of that old adage, the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. Certainly that technology is impressive, but strategic impact was even more so. The air operation last fall, militarily robust, but it was politically fragile. At the first report of civilian casualties or collateral damage, the entire operation would have been put at serious risk. The mission preparation that our new information technologies enabled us to employ was, in large part, responsible for the fact that the report of civilian casualties never came, and we were able to press the campaign through to completion. A lot of things had to go right for our air operation to create the conditions for the peace which has now settled over that land. Technology such as power scene played a major role in ensuring that they did just that. In that visit to Aviano and Vincenza, I saw the edge of today's art of the possible. At another location this spring, I saw the future. I caught a glimpse of generation and the possibilities that lie before us to be seized if we have the vision and the energy. I hosted the other service secretaries in a conference focusing on modeling and simulation. We flew down to the Joint Training and Simulation Center at the U.S. Atlantic Command near Langley. We toured the facilities that they have established there just over the past few months. They have built a battle lab training our Joint Force Commanders and their staffs so that future Mike Ryans will have a chance to explore their options, to see the law consequences of their decisions, and to get a look at how an intelligent adversary might respond to various decisions. At that command center, we can conduct an exercise which integrates real decision makers working against a simulated enemy force and real aircraft flown on training ranges thousands of miles away against simulated adversaries using modeled weaponry so that we can get a look at how these new weapons will affect our capabilities. From that command center, as we exercise, we can command an Aegis cruiser in the Mediterranean or a Patriot battery in Korea or an AWACS in Southwest Asia, or if we wish, all at the same time. We have just begun to work with abilities and to understand their potential. One thing I can confidently predict, though, is that the potential we don't yet see will be at least as important as the payoffs we realize today. The law of unintended consequences is alive and well. So while we're busily engaged in the present, we are thinking hard about the future. We're doing what we can to use our knowledge today to imagine where we might go tomorrow. The latest study by the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board, New World Vistas, describes some very exciting technical abilities. And we've also established in the course a long-range planning group to lay out the paths towards the most promising military capabilities. We're trying to face the future in a systematic and broad-based way working together among all our disciplines to find a clear and coherent course. At the heart of this transformation, we have the stunning advances in information and communications technology. Our blueprint is a balanced,
time phased modernization program as the engine for the process we're streamlining our business practices and improving efficiencies in all aspects of our operations over the past year instituted a series of acquisition reform initiatives the lightning bolts designed to jump start the revolution in our acquisition processes although this movement is only ending we have already seen tangible benefits we see weapon systems coming in at one third of their projected costs we see craft modification programs coming in under cost of schedule precisely because the air force industry team has the advantage of this revolution already we have achieved thirteen billion dollars in cost avoidance and we intend further we intend to sweep away shelves of old regulations and directives to sweep away paperwork and adversarial relationships that long existed between the air force and our partners in industry this reform movement is not a nice to have it's a pass fail item these reforms must succeed we must free up resources that we need to sustain our modernization programs and we must place these programs on an absolutely solid basis of efficiency if we fail in these reforms we will fail in our efforts to build the capability we need to exit our missions and we will fall short of our obligation to this nation to our people I can't imagine a more powerful incentive to see these through the capabilities we're developing will ensure that our forces are second to none some promising programs deserve special recognition the first flight of the stealth F-22 fighter is less than a year away our airborne laser and joint strike fighter programs are off and running we are developing a new family of commercial expendable launch vehicles to tour the nation affordable access to space in the years ahead we're beginning to look at expanded uses for unmanned aerial vehicles and we're working towards a gps greatly increased accuracy but as always we must look beyond the technology of weaponry to the people who make it all work in the end it's the brains and ingenuity and the intuition of the chess master who controls the and in the end it well trained high quality people who help the air force who make the air force is people in the air force come from all over the united states from a wide variety of backgrounds cultures and traditions and yet they share a great patriotism a confidence and a hope in our country and they take an oath to defend america against all enemies foreign and domestic that oath is an offer of themselves to guarantee the well-being and success of our country it's a commitment to our nation and a promise to its people we in the air force recognize our responsibilities to guard and champion the things that form the wellspring of america's greatness its natural resources its technology its people and its values we take the responsibility seriously continue to help steer her towards a future of peace plenty and prosperity we undertake this responsibility we need your help we cannot succeed without the understanding support of the american people and the people in this room are key to that support so as we part today i ask you to reflect on the range of responsibilities that this nation rightly demands of its armed forces together we sustain the commitment that has brought us to this promising point and together can build today's air force the finest the world has ever seen into the force that our nation needs in the decade come thank you very much for your attention and i'd be happy to respond to any questions we have a few questions here about budget cuts okay you talked about reforming the system and, and cost cutting but you also have a rather ambitious plan to the quality of life for, uh, for people in the Air Force and also to modernize the force structure. How can you balance all of the requirements at a time when your budget is shrinking? Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, you know, I, the budget, I wouldn't characterize the budget as shrinking. It's flat, I think, at this point. I would characterize it as flat, and we think it's going to be flat for the foreseeable future. We know I don't believe anybody's expecting budget growths. Uh, we have had to make some very tough decisions but the uh, that we have presented uh, that the president has presented on behalf of the defense department this does represent our priorities and uh, we feel very comfortable with the uh, budget request that we've made 
But having said that, we are looking at both acquisition reform in a very broad sense as well as privatization initiatives to open up a wedge of available resources to carry out our modernization program. Uh, just to give you some tangible examples of what acquisition reform really means, I could pick out the C-17, which I personally consider to be one of the outstanding examples of acquisition reform. Uh, in 1993, you probably couldn't read a press account of the C-17 without reading the words troubled program. I think it was put in there by the word processor. It sort of had automatically. Um, have just completed um, laying the foundation for a seven-year, multi-year buy of the C-17, price which is roughly cut in half of what it was in 1993. Uh, the additional uh, multi-year saved on top of everything that had been saved in the development of the aircraft itself, an additional billion dollars. Uh, we can, on a much smaller scale with smaller programs, we have seen similar examples of cost saving through acquisition reform. It isn't just cost saving, it's time saving, it's better program, increased quality. Uh, so we are, we are pursuing that track and, and uh, we're really delighted with the results. Uh, at the, uh, the level of, of local bases, we hope to uh, initiate privatization um, efforts which will allow us to reduce the cost of base operating support. We already have some significant examples of this in some of our commands. And so, again, we're Stick Fisher and they're working very hard on that. We do have a question about privatization outsourcing. Uh, how was that mentioned that you had some positive results? Could you name a couple of specific sure. examples? Mm -hmm. Um, there are a lot of examples, but let me uh, talk a little bit about the um, Air Education and Training Command. Um, their mission is to, to train pilots. Uh, they use the uh, T-37 and T-38 to do that. They have five or six bases in the U.S. Uh, this is a unit, obviously, that does not deploy uh, so that the, the aircraft at the home base. The maintenance of those aircraft have be, has been contracted to the civilian sector. And uh, I can't quote you chapter and verse on the money saved, but it is, it is a large percentage of cost, and it gives us some, some uh, optimism that similar examples of with the private sector can save similar amounts of money in appropriate situations. Um, I did emphasize the fact that this unit does not deploy, because if a unit deploys, then you obviously need to take your maintainers with you. So it, each individual uh, command uh, needs to structure its privatization uh, efforts in order to uh, meet its principal mission. So is what is possible for air command is not possible for air combat command, for example. But so there is a lot of it going on. Results to date have been very good. We normally we do privatization efforts with a competition, um, both private sector and with uh, you know the the in-house people. And in many situations, the in-house people have won the competition through increased uh, efficiency. So the answer could be different depending on, uh, on what the local situation is. Also a related budget question. American federal civ civilian agencies are like the Air Force doing more with less. Can't the Air Force downsize further, especially since, as you said, the U.S. is the only king on the chessboard? Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me uh, make sure that everybody understands how far we have already come down. Uh, we have uh, come down by one-third in the number of people in uniform. I'm not sure that most people realize uh, how far we have already come down. And we are projected to come down an equal amount in our uh, civilian employees. I can think of few industries in our country um, that have downsized by a third in as short a period of time. Uh, we obviously continue to look at that. We continue to uh, ask questions about what roles, what, what tasks have to be done by military personnel, what tasks have to be done by civilians, and what are the opportunities for privatization. So we will continue to look at everything we do, but come down very rapidly since 1991. Over a third of them are no longer with us. And so uh, there have been substantial savings from that. Many, many believe maintaining an Air Force, military, and naval academy is an exercise in, duplica uh, in duplication and waste. A single academy could be developed to do the job. What's your view on this idea? Well, I, you hear that, 
um, that idea floated from time to time. Um, I guess I don't believe that there would be any savings from that. Uh, first of all, if you try to combine the academies, you simply have to build more buildings at one of them. Um, I think there is an uh, inherent, very healthy competition that exists uh, between the service academies. It, it sharpens everybody uh, to, to deliver excellence in the product that they produce. Um, and I think it builds a core among the students. I certainly want to make it clear that we do have exchange programs with the other academies. Uh, some Air Force Academy students spend a, a semester at either West Point or Naval Academy or Coast Guard. So there is a, a building of cautery among the students at the service academies. But in terms of simply consolidating the physical plant, I'm not sure that, uh, that one would really realize the savings that are occasionally talked about. And I think it would be a great loss for the culture of the services. Based on your science background, do you think a national missile defense system against a limited rogue nation threat is possible? Well, I, I, I consider, I mean, as a personal view, I think it's an extremely difficult technical problem. And uh, as, you, as many of you know, we're engaged right now in R&D efforts within the department to put together the various pieces of a system uh, for that mission. Uh, I, I consider it a great technical challenge, and I do believe that the R&D is, is money well spent. Don't we share our bombing capabilities and precision with the Israelis? If so, what is your view on why the Israeli bombing in Lebanon resulted in the tragic number of casualties in the UN compound in Lebanon? I don't have any opinion on that issue. When you were introduced, it was stated that this flies 200 missions per day in combat zones. Where are these flights taking place, and why is it necessary to put so many Americans at risk? Uh, we are, we are uh, maintaining no-fly zones in, in uh, three regions of the world. One is in Bosnia, and the other is in northern Iraq, where we have been involved in provide comfort since the end of the war, uh, basically to stabilize the uh, situation in the north and protect the Kurdish population in that region. And then the third uh, zone is in southern Iraq, uh, where we maintain a no-fly zone as a, basically a deterrent to further aggression by Saddam Hussein. You mentioned Air Force reservists recalled for the Bosnian operation. Why do we have to recall reservists? Can't our active duty Air Force handle the Bosnia problem? Actually, we, uh, we use reservists on a, on a volunteer basis. Uh, we, are, we actually technically are not recalling them, but they actually jump at the chance. Uh, our reservists are here in the U.S., and they're training, and they're training for these kinds of missions. And uh, when we ask them if they would like to spend two weeks to a month uh, flying in the Bosnian operation, they, they jump at the chance. It's excellent training, it's a chance to use their skills, and it certainly gives relief to the active duty. Uh, we have been maintaining these no-fly zones for several years, and it has created an operations tempo issue within the active duty force, and so to be able to send active duty units back to their home base uh, for you know, uh, re reunions with their families, uh, I think is a good thing, and uh, it basically keeps our Air Force um, sort of at the leading edge in terms of readiness. So we've had excellent uh, results from, uh, from using Guard and Reserve in these situations, and uh, it's worked out very well. Since all Air Force pilots must file a flight, flight plan, and that flight plan must be approved, who authorized Ron Brown's plane to go to an unauthorized airport in bad weather? Uh, I guess, you know, fundamentally it was the process that was set up by the chain of command in the wing at Ramstein. And, and that situation has been really thoroughly asked and commented on in the report that, the, uh, that General Coolidge and his board released, and the situation was fully discussed. We have a few other questions about that, that plane crash. The Air Force hierarchy, including yourself, has, has said most of the blame belongs to pilot error. 
Uh, Ms. Ms. Hill, however, has said that a business partner, Ron Brown, has said she spoke with him prior to the plane crash when he allegedly stated that he was pressuring the pilots to take off. Can you categorically state today that the Air Force investigators looked at all incoming and outgoing phone calls, including hers, to see if there were any communications? And if, if you have, can you definitely say there were no such calls? Well, let me, let me say, first of all, that the question contains two assertions of facts that are not in evidence. Um, I think it's very clear to state that the accident board was, was very, very careful to not rank the causes of this accident in any priority. The causes were uh, failure of command, uh, an improper approach uh, plate, and, uh, and uh, you know, failure in the, you know, the pilots. Uh, so I, I, I sort of reserve, you know, uh, reject the assertion that uh, we said it was pilot air. Uh, the second thing is that there has been follow-up on the stories about these conversations and uh, the, tr uh, the uh, affidavit that we received from, uh, from Ms. Hill through her lawyer uh, does not say that there were any conversations about pressure and she cleared that, that issue up. Uh, so having said that, I would say the board uh, went back and, uh, and investigated the issue of pressure. We found no evidence that there was pressure on the crew applied by anybody to make that flight. One final last tough question on, the, uh, on Ron Brown's plane crash. It has been alleged that Air Force General Stevens has been made a scapegoat as a result of the plane crash. Your comments, please. Well, again, I think the report did a very comprehensive job of laying out um, the, the failures of command that were evident. I think many of the, um, the media comments on the issue came prior to the release of the accident report. I guess my own view is that the situation with the release of the re report, I think the situation has been clarified and I, I would uh, simply suggest that you read the report and make your own judgment about that issue. Moving a little bit up to the hill, with Congress ordering four to six F-16s per year, how can the Air Force get to the 120 it says it needs in a reasonable time frame? How many would you really like per year? Well, obviously we are trying to um, establish a reserve for attrition, uh, but the timeline on which we have to do that is fairly long. We really don't need to complete that until about 2010. So. Uh, we are not in any sort of panic about, about F-16s. We have a good, healthy F-16 fleet now, and if we continue to acquire them at the kind of rate, uh, you know, as we move into the future, uh, I, I feel pretty comfortable at this point. Representative Durbin is proposing an amendment to require contractors to state the amount of work done by foreign suppliers in their bids to DOD. What is your position on this? Well, I don't have any position on that. I guess they'll be asking you for one shortly. <laughs> Turn it over to Conyers. <laughs> Are the countries that want NATO membership prepared militarily to assume defense obligations? If not, when will they be up to it? Well, clearly that's a, uh, that's a question for, for the NATO structure. And, and I'm sure, as all of you know, the NATO membership requires a unanimous vote of member of countries, and I'm sure that those those issues will be, you know, thoroughly assessed for each individual country that uh, that is given NATO membership. Secretary Perry has said that U.S. forces may need to stay longer in Bosnia. How much longer do you think they may need to stay? Well, it seems to me that the Secretary, uh, in, in um, articles that appeared today, uh, made it very clear that in his view I-4 was going to end at the appropriate time, and that the question of what happens after that is really a question for NATO. He also remarked that NATO has not taken this issue up, and, and to take it up at this point would be premature. You've mentioned you're interested in, in improving the quality of life for people in the Air Force. What specifically do you have in mind? 
Well, the Air Force has quite a comprehensive quality of life program. Um, it's obvious that each individual in the Air Force puts a different priority on the various aspects of quality of life. Uh, we survey our people uh, fairly regularly. Um, we actually have an online way of conducting quality of life surveys, so we get fairly immediate feedback. Uh, obviously, the, the, the important items are pay, um, pay and benefits, medical is extremely important, um, military family housing is an important issue for many people, um, child care is an important issue. Uh, one important issue that uh, I guess it doesn't really come as a surprise, but it's, it's kind of more intangible, is just the security of living on a base. Uh, people really appreciate that, the, the notion that uh, you know, that they are in a secure environment. Uh, that turns out to be a very important item for many families. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to it. One of our big initiatives this year is to move to um, a better dormitory situation to get rid of uh, gang latrines and to get people into uh, either private rooms or, you know, rooms that share a kitchen bath arrangement. Uh, it's a high priority for us and we're trying to put as much money in the budget as possible to accomplish that by the turn of the century. When will the Air Force release the 75 million appropriated last year for the Clementine II program? No, I can't comment that. I think that that uh, is with the uh, DOD comptroller at this point. You mentioned the Air Force uh, being the king on the chessboard. Who internationally are, are the biggest rivals out there? Are you saying to the Air Force or to, I mean, I, or to the U.S.? Uh, I mean, I'm clearly the, the uh, I would say we have a fairly, you know, complex set of relationships with other countries. Um, and I, I don't want to characterize any of those relationships as being adversarial. But, uh, you know, clearly we have relationships with a lot of countries that we hope will become even even better friends than they are now. As someone who came to the Air Force, the first woman to head the Air Force, and also as someone with a civilian background, what have been the biggest difficulties for you in, in overcoming those two, I guess, new, rather new aspects? Could you go through that again? <laughs> As the first woman to head the Air Force, and, actually, and also as someone with a civilian background, have there been any particular difficulties for you? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, but let me make it, you know, pr you know clear that, that the notion of civilian control of the military is in our Constitution. So, I mean, I don't understand the question having to do with the civilian part of it. Uh, with respect to being a woman, I would say that there's been great enthusiasm about, uh, about my appointment as Secretary of the Air Force, and uh, the Air Force has been just tremendously supportive uh, as I became Secretary, and it's just been loads of fun. <laughs> what impact has the defense industry's consolidation had on Air Force procurement? Are you concerned about vertical integration or lack of competition? Well, I've been extremely gratified by the restructuring of the defense industry because basically what it means is lower overhead. Uh, I think it means a greater efficiency in programs. Uh, it means sort of more modern ways of looking at organizations, continuous improvement, quality, streamlining, delayering, reform. So I think it's been a very uh, positive, positive development. And, uh, you know, I, I find in, in our new programs as we move forward that, you know, we're dealing with a, a very healthy industry and one that is able to group and regroup uh, to the demands of a particular program. So I think it's great. Back to the budget for a minute. In an era of big budget deficits and cost cutting, why is it necessary to finance a prep school for the Air Force Academy? Actually, I'm a big fan of the prep school. Um, I think the prep school is probably one of the unheralded success stories in American high school education. Uh, it is a real um, kind of experimental training ground. The prep school takes students who could not quite qualify for the Air Force Academy because of disadvantaged school backgrounds 
and it really teaches the basics. I haven't visited them recently, but they basically teach math, science, and English. You know, talk about getting back to the basics. And uh, I, I just, I get very excited about the prep school because I think it really does a very good job of taking young people who really have the stuff and giving them a tremendous opportunity to take the next step in their lives. And I think that's well worth it. Please comment on the latest Air Force efforts to equip aircraft, to equip its aircraft to prevent tragedies such as the T-43 incident in Dubrovnik. What implement, Im impediments does the Air Force face in executing these activities? Uh, well, I, I don't want to go into it. There is a rather comprehensive detail available on this. Uh, but just sort of to try to summarize it, we are moving to put GPS on our aircraft. Uh, we're moving to put the cockpit voice recorders and data recorders, which would, of course, not prevented the tragedy, but would have made the job of the accident board somewhat easier if they had survived the crash. Um, but uh, we are moving to upgrade the avionics and, uh, and the navigation, uh, along with, of course, the civilian fleet, which is engaged in the same sort of thing as we move to the new era in, in uh, air transportation that, that relies on GPS for navigation. So we're going to be a part of that, and uh, I think that will be uh, an improvement. The Russian election, as you know, is coming up this weekend. Do you have any particular concerns about the stability of forces there, should there be a change in government? Uh, no, I mean, on, on that issue, I'm just a typical American citizen. I'm watching the, uh, watching the developments and uh, obviously have concern about what this means for our country, but I have no special insight into what's going on. Also a budget question. The Republican Congress wants more military spending. The White House wants less. Where do you stand? Uh, I stand with the White House. <laughs> Why should the Pentagon reimburse defense contractors for restructuring costs they no doubt would incur anyway as they merge? Well, I'm not sure what you're talking about, actually. Uh, I mean, I know that there have been some special uh, proposals that some of which have been accepted by the Department of Defense. Obviously, we do things when we feel it's in our interests. And what I mean by our interests is the interests of the American taxpayer and uh, our ability to use our budget dollars in the in the uh, wisest way. If we make a deal, it's because we think in the long run it's going to save us big bucks. With that particular proposal, are there big bucks to be saved? Is there a, a rationale, a cost-cutting rationale, or long-term savings co rationale for that? Uh, I'm not quite sure which agreement you're talking about. Can you be more specific? The question you didn't. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I know what you're, you're probably talking about. The Lockheed. Is that what you're talking about? Well, any defense. Yeah, any of it. That, that presents a plan. Right. Campus. Sure. Right. Well, as I say, it's looked at it on a case-by-case -case basis, and what we are trying to do is act in the national interest. Uh, having said that, I would say that it is definitely in our long-range interest to cut overhead. This has been extremely important, and it really allows the defense dollar to go further. Before we ask a last question, I just wanted to pre present this certificate of appreciation. Thank you. And also a National Press Club <laughs> coffee mug. Since you are a rather historic figure, and I'd, you may not want, want me to use those terms at the Air Force, if there's one thing you can accomplish um, for the rest of your tenure, what would you want it to be? Well, I think, I mean, that is a tough issue because with my background in technology, people always assume that what I really want to do is modernize the force. And, and of course, that's true. We see an enormous number of opportunities in that. but. I think you should also remember that I'm an educator. And, and so my basic motivation is to improve opportunity, mentoring, uh, the quality. I've stressed core values for the Air Force, sort of bringing us back to basics in terms of human values. I obviously want um, to leave a legacy of 
opportunity for individuals in the Air Force to use their skills, you know, to sort of push themselves to the utmost of their capabilities. Uh, so I think in the end it is the, the people of the Air Force and their ability to, to do their jobs uh, to the utmost of their capabilities that, that I hope will be my legacy. We would like to thank you for coming to the National Press Club, Dr. Woodnall, and thank you all for coming as well. Hope to see you at future lunches. Thank you.